morning, everyone. Welcome to this press conference on the IMS Fiscal Monitor. I am Ting Chen from the Communications Department. I hope you and your families are doing well and are staying safe. Let me first introduce our three speakers today. We have Vitor Gaspar, Director of the Fiscal Affairs Department, and Paulo Mauro, Deputy Director of the Fiscal Affairs Department, and also Paulo Medes, Division Chief in the Fiscal Affairs Department. Vitor will first give some opening remarks to highlight the key messages of the Fiscal Monitor Report, and then we will be happy to take your questions via WebEx or IMF Press Center. With that, Vitor, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, uh, Ting. Welcome. Thanks for your interest on fiscal policy developments and prospects all around the world based on the Fiscal Monitor. More than a year and a half after the start of COVID-19, decisive global action is necessary to tackle the great vaccine divide, the great finance divide, and climate change. Here, I focus on the great finance divide. Because of COVID-19 and of policies put in place to respond to it, debt level increased fast and reached high levels. High and rising levels of public and private debt are associated with risks to financial stability and public finances. I want to start with global debt. Given that we now have preliminary estimates from the Global Debt Database for 2020, in the slide you see percentages of GDP, but I will be quoting dollar figures. The debt of governments, households, and non-financial corporations added up to $226 trillion in 2020. That's $27 trillion above 2019. This increase is by far the largest on record. Advanced economies and China contributed more than 90% to the accumulation of worldwide debt in 2020. The remaining emerging markets and low-income developing countries contributed only around 7%. Constraints on financing are particularly severe for poorer countries. This great finance divide will be a guiding thread for my presentation. In 2020, fiscal policy proved its worth. The increase in public debt in 2020 was fully justified by the need to respond to COVID-19 and its economic, social, and financial consequences. But the increase is expected to be one-off as documented in Chapter 1 of the Fiscal Monitor. Debt is expected to decline this year and next by about one percentage point of GDP per year. After that, it is projected to stabilize at about 97% of GDP. These dynamics are driven by a strong contribution from nominal GDP growth, accompanied by a much more gradual reduction in the primary deficit. Differences across country groups appear again when looking at fiscal policy and economic developments. Differences are clear not only across country groups, but also within country groups. It follows that policy advice must be tailored to the evolution of the epidemic, to economic developments and prospects, but also country characteristics. Advanced economies are projected to recover to the pre-COVID growth path. Fiscal support will persist, but spending, revenues, and the primary balance will gradually approach the pre-COVID path. China and the US stand out with early and strong recoveries. In contrast, low-income developing countries that you see on the right are projected to suffer persistent fall in growth relative to the pre-COVID prospects. Lower growth and shortfalls in revenues are major concerns for the eradication of extreme poverty and more generally from the viewpoint of sustainable and inclusive development. Financing gaps to achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030 were already considerable before COVID. The pandemic made prospects even worse. Data and our analysis 
suggest that the ability to issue debt at favorable terms was precious in the year of the pandemic. But what determines the degree of access to financial markets? Many factors play a role. But a major theme of the annual meetings is that credibility of monetary and fiscal frameworks is important for all countries. Chapter 2 of the Fiscal Monitor shows that countries with a high credibility, uh, highly credible fiscal framework benefit from better bond market access. Countries with high credibility face lower interest rates on sovereign bonds. The bottom line? Fiscal responsibility pays off. While recognizing that the international community provided critical support to alleviate fiscal vulnerabilities in low-income countries, more is needed. The recent general allocation of special drawing rights contributes to international liquidity. This $650 billion is the largest SDR allocation agreed upon ever. Its beneficial effects can be exponentiated through voluntary channeling from higher income economies to low income developing countries. Options for voluntary channeling, including financing for the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust or through a new resilience and sustainability trust. By voluntary channeling of SDRs in such a way, Donor countries would be contributing to sustainable development and international convergence. The expiration of the DSSI at the end of the year makes a fully functioning G20 common framework urgently needed. The great vaccine divide, the great finance divide and climate change affect everyone, but especially the poorest and most vulnerable. Sustainable, inclusive development is key everywhere. It must be green and digital. National and global policy action must work hand in hand. Time is of the essence. It is urgent to invest for the longer term to ensure a durable and inclusive structural transformation. Financing is one of the essential keys. The diagnosis is clear. Action is urgent. Thank you so much, Vitor. Now we can take your questions. Um, please submit your questions on IMF Press Center, or you can ask your questions on WebEx. Our first questions come from Lali Jeha, PTI. Lali? Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you for doing this uh, so early in the morning. I really appreciate it. Uh, I have a quick question. Um, uh, Vita, in your opening remarks, you called for urgency of action. What are the dangers of inaction? And secondly, the Indian government has announced a series of economic reforms. Uh, what is your assessment of the fiscal situation of the country right now? Thank you. Th thanks for your questions. I will address the uh, first uh, question, and Paolo will address the second. I sounded the alarm on three major issues that require urgent global action. I call it the great vaccine divide following the uh, chief economist of the IMF, Gita Gopidat, the great finance divide and climate change. Global recovery is very uncertain and held back by the availability of uh, vaccines. The IMF, together with other uh, international organizations, has put out a plan that with a price tag of $50 billion uh, would ensure uh, fast progress in vaccination around the world with the headline objective of ensuring 40% of the population vaccinated in every country before the end of this year. We quantify that uh, failure to contain the epidemic through such effective action could cost in excess of five trillion dollars over five years. We all, I also stressed very much in this presentation what I call the great finance divide. 
uh, COVID-19 has hit particularly hard uh, the uh, people who are most vulnerable, which includes the poor and those who have uh, constrained access uh, to finance. In that uh, context, making resources available to low-income uh, developing uh, countries is extremely important to attain the uh, sustainable development goals. But climate change is also a urgent uh, priority. Climate change is also associated with strong dynamics and uncertainty, and early action uh, pays off. Uh, we, again, uh, emphasize the vulnerability of the uh, poorest countries, and in Glasgow, effective action by advanced economies to uh, ensure transfers of technology and financing of developing countries in line with previous commitments is very important. It's also very important uh, to launch the uh, Resilience and Sustainability uh, Trust that will allow financing instruments to be tailored to the transition uh, uh, needs of low-income developing countries. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, turning to the Indian uh, reforms recently, and this also links to some of the things that Vitor just mentioned, uh, I think the starting point is that the situation is improving when it comes to the epidemic. Uh, it's very different from a few months ago. Fortunately, the number of cases is declining. Uh, the vaccination is becoming more widespread. Uh, on the economic front, uh, therefore, even though the situation is improving, the priority remains to address the health emergency. It remains to provide ample support, particularly to the poorer segments of the population through social protection, employment benefits, and so on. Uh, as we move towards the recovery, it's also important to focus on public investment, particularly on green investment, so that the recovery can be inclusive and green. Uh, this said, India's debt is at a ratio of about 90%, and it's important to give a signal that uh, there's a medium-term fiscal framework in place, that assures investors and the debt ratio will decline in the medium term. Um, in terms of more recent uh, reforms, one that I would like to highlight is the uh, National Asset Reconstruction Company, the so-called Bad Bank. Uh, this is potentially very promising because it's important to tackle non-performing loans. Uh, this has been a long-standing drag on credit and uh, potentially this is very promising. It's very important that uh, both the governance and the independence of uh, such so-called bad bank be in place uh, so that the costs to the public finances can be uh, kept under control and uh, one can go back to promoting inclusive growth. Thank you, Vito. Thank you, Paolo. We also received a question from Heather Scott, AFP. Her question is, how big is the risk that a slow recovery and rising debt in emerging and low-income countries could lead to a more profound crisis or need for debt restructuring? Is there a risk that vulnerable countries will have to sharply decrease key spending in order to prevent a debt crisis? Maybe I, I can answer this question. And let me build a bit on what Vitor already mentioned. The reality is many advanced economies were able to use large fiscal, power, uh, uh, fiscal firepower in response to the pandemic. But this was not the case in many other countries. Developing economies have faced very tight and tighter uh, financing constraints. So even though they were hit very hard from the crisis, they have, been, they have not been able to do as much fiscal support as advanced economies. In reality, what we see is that almost half of low-income developing countries are already at debt distress or at risk of it. We also see, as Peter said already mentioned, that there will be long-term scarring in emerging markets in low-income countries, partly because of this lower uh, policy support. What we'll see is the output and tax revenues will be uh, lower 
than the pre-pandemic trends. This will make it harder to, uh, to manage the debt over the medium term. So we do see that action is needed on several fronts. On the domestic front, countries need to do more to mobilize uh, tax resources and to spend better and more efficiently. This will help not only manage debt, but also achieve the sustainable development goals. But not only domestic action is needed, we also emphasize that international support is going to be needed. One, to help get everyone vaccinated on the world, and two, to help the lowest income countries that are highly indebted better manage their financing constraints. Of course, action has already been taken, but more needs to be done. For example, uh, 47 countries already took advantage of the debt service um, suspension initiative. Uh, this has helped them uh, allocate resources to fight the pandemic, but didn't prevent that other priority spend uh, had to be cut already. Um, we also, the IMF uh, has uh, also allocated $117 billion to, more, to 85 countries to help out to provide financial support or debt service relief. Uh, we also are working with other countries to make sure, uh, like for example, the, initial, the debt uh, relief initiatives of the G20 are more effective and help more countries. And of course, as, as Vitor already mentioned, the $650 billion uh, allocation in SDRs can also make a big difference, especially if uh, advanced economies can channel uh, their increase, their allocation increase to low-income countries to help uh, on manage their uh, pressure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, so Paolo. Stop here. Now, let's go back to WebEx. We have a question from Mao Ling Xiong, Xinhua News Agency. Mao Ling, please go ahead. Thank you very much for doing this. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, firstly, uh, could you uh, share some insights on the recently reached goal on uh, re recently reached deal on minimum quality tax under the framework of OECD? We expect the deal to help resolve the digital tax tensions. Uh, secondly, on China, uh, China's deficit is expected to uh, to reduce and debt is still increasing. Uh, how should the Chinese government continue to boost recovery and stabilize debt levels uh, with its fiscal policy? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mao Lin. I will take both your questions. On the uh, international deal on uh, corporate uh, taxation, I would very much insist that it is a historic moment. The uh, system that we now have was basically conceptually agreed by the League of Nations about 100 years ago. Just think about the economy uh, 100 years ago and how much it has changed. So the fact that we were able now to reach an agreement to reform international corporate taxation is a major breakthrough. In terms of 2021, is one of the highlights of the year in terms of our global cooperation. In terms of the meaning of the deal itself, the deal does basically two things. In what is called Pillar 2, it agrees on a minimum for uh, the corporate income tax rate all around the world, and that breaks the race to the bottom. In Pillar 1, it attributes taxing rights to market countries. And by doing so, it moves partially towards a destination principle in international taxation that has been shown uh, to be robust to, uh, international, uh, to international integration. That basically means that we have a cooperative uh, way forward in the field of tax, and that is a major development. On China, China has been able to contain uh, COVID-19 relatively early. China is a country that is uh, benefiting 
from a strong recovery. China was one of the few countries in the world where economic activity did not contract in uh, 2020. That basically means that uh, fiscal policy in China is able to adjust very gradually uh, over time, and that seems to be broadly appropriate to the Chinese conditions. Two points taking a longer time frame. First of all, a rebalancing of the Chinese uh, growth model, a uh, transition to a more sustainable development path will require a uh, transfer of uh, spending from investment to consumption. And here, uh, fiscal uh, policy has a role to play, including by increasing, by strengthening the social protection uh, system. Probably it makes sense to highlight the uh, potential of increased medical and unemployment uh, benefits, but uh, China is also using technology to improve social uh, protection, and the use of uh, uh, digital wallets has uh, been uh, used to reach uh, segments of the population that would be hard uh, to reach otherwise. From a long-run perspective, uh, China, as many other countries in the world, is facing a demographic uh, transition. And so it's very important in that context that it benefits from a long-run uh, approach uh, to public uh, finance management so that those challenges associated with long-run growth and demographic uh, transition can be tackled appropriately. Thank you. Next, we have a question from WebEx from Dua Abdel Nurmonin from Ahram Online, Egypt. Dua, please go ahead. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Good morning, all. Thank you, Tim, for taking my questions. I have two questions. Uh, the first is on uh, the debt issue. So, uh, at the elevated uh, debt levels is a key consequence of the COVID uh, cri COVID nineteen crisis. GDP. What do you think? What What are the IMF's expectations for the debt to GDP ratio in developing countries? and emerging markets, especially in MENA region, over the medium and long terms. My second question is on the uh, issue of the rise in energy prices. So, this rise will affect many of families and small businesses that are already struggling amid the ongoing uh, pandemic crisis. Are you concerned that large uh, energy prices will hurt the economy? And what can governments do, um, including uh, should they give subsidies to, to deal with this uh, issue. Thank you so much. So let me say a few words about the debt and uh, MENA, the Middle East and North Africa region, and then perhaps uh, Paolo can elaborate on the issue of energy prices. Um, so specifically, the numerical aspect of your question when it comes to MENA uh, we are on average uh, at the end of 2020 at a debt ratio of 52% and we project that by 2025 that ratio will have slightly declined to 48%. Uh, this is not unusual for emerging markets as a whole. Uh, for most emerging markets indeed we, we project that there's going to be a stabilization and a gradual decline, a uh, very small decline in the debt ratio going forward, starting, of course, as you said, from a higher debt uh, at the moment uh, compared to pre-pandemic. Uh, one big exception to that would be China, uh, where we project a continued increase in the debt ratio. But I do want to emphasize the uh, very wide diversity uh, among emerging markets. Um, just take the starting point in the region. Egypt uh, right now has a debt ratio of about 90%. And also thinking about developments in the oil markets, uh, you know, some countries are net exporters, others are not, and that's going to make a big difference. Um, what I would 
highlight is in terms of the policy prescription, it very much depends on country circumstances. There are countries where the epidemic is still raging, others where things are getting a little bit better. Uh, the pace of the recovery is very different across emerging markets. Um, we have cases of countries that can finance themselves relatively easily and others that are shut out from uh, global financial markets. And, and last but not least, more recently, we're seeing that some countries have high inflation at this point, uh, whereas others still have inflation under control. So depending on those, uh, the prescription would, would differ. What's common to all of these countries is the importance of uh, explaining to the public and to investors uh, what is the medium-term fiscal framework. Um, on energy prices, maybe Paolo, you can say a bit more. Sure. Uh, let me give you a, a, a bit of a context. Um, so the increase to some degree was expected because it followed uh, the large recession last year and falling prices. So this is partially a recovery. Second, uh, economies are now much less dependent on oil and gas than a few decades ago. So that's going to help manage this increase. But the reality is that uh, if these uh, large price increases that we observe in some regions of the world were to persist, they would dampen economic growth. They would affect uh, families' budgets. Uh, so the question is, what can uh, governments do, especially, uh, as you mentioned, uh, we are in the trying to get out of the pandemic. Many families and businesses are still suffering. So I think one, one of the points we wanted to make is that we don't recommend uh, generalized energy subsidies, fuel subsidies. Uh, and the reason is because usually they are very costly. They benefit uh, high uh, rich households who don't need support. And uh, they are uh, 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 not very, uh, f not friendly to the environment. In fact, they, they lead to uh, very negative incentives. But there are measures governments can take in the short term to to try to alleviate the impacts. And one of the things we, we stress is obviously using uh, more targeted support to those that are more uh, vulnerable and the hardest hit by these increases. For example, countries can use uh, targeted cash transfers. If they don't have this, they can use uh, existing systems they may have in their safety networks. One example some countries are using is uh, subsidized electricity bills for the families that have low incomes. Countries that have regular the domestic prices can also uh, include rules that smooth the price increase so that families don't have to see large volatility in their monthly prices. And, uh, takes more time to adjust. So these are several measures governments can take in the short term. But look, the reality is that we have faced this large volatility in oil and gas prices for a long time. And the only way to, to deal with this in a permanent way is move ahead towards greener economies. Countries need to invest more in a diversified uh, energy matrix based on renewable and clean energy. This is going to be the only way you build uh, uh, resilient economies uh, and protect households from this very large volatility in oil and gas prices. Uh, and of course, this is a critical part of the climate agenda, so it needs to be pursued. Thank okay. you. Next, we have a question from Shuichiro Takaoka, GG Press Japan. Shu, please go ahead. Are you there, Shu? Hey, can I? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is about uh, SSI. Vitor uh, uh, has mentioned that area that uh, DSSI is expired at uh, the end of this year. And uh, then uh, how should we make uh, effective uh, the common framework? Uh, what is your view on that point? And the uh, second question is on Japan. Uh, Japanese uh, debt level uh, is uh, still high as usual. And uh, you expect it would last long 
And、uh, can you say, is it really sustainable,、uh, especially given Japanese、uh, matured and aging society? Thank you.、Uh, thank you so much. I will、uh, tackle your second question first and then, then the first. So, on Japan,、uh, that in Japan, as in other advanced economies, increased. Quite sharply in、uh, 2020, and in our forecast, it is projected to continue to increase this year. After that, as、uh, happens in many advanced economies as well, it will come gradually down, although at a level substantially higher than pre pandemic. We do not see Uh, risks associated with this high level of debt for Japan in the short run. Rollover risks are low given the current complementarity between fiscal and monetary、uh, policy and the、uh, savings base、uh, in Japan is、uh, quite solid. Now, if you look Beyond the、uh, current situation, you should recognize first that compared with our forecast one year ago, the projections for the public debt to GDP ratio in Japan have been revised quite significantly down. So things are now looking better than a year ago, but there are very long run challenges. That the Japanese、uh, economy is facing. Some dates that I find、uh, mnemonic having to do with demographic transition、uh, in Japan is that the total population in Japan started declining in 2010, so already 11 years ago. The labor force started declining in、uh, 90, 95, and the Bank of Japan. Has been operating under the shadow of the effective lower bound since 1999. To tackle issues that have to do with low neutral real interest rates, low growth, and the demographic transition in Japan, Japan needs a very long run、uh, perspective. And in that context, the advice in Chapter 2 of the Fiscal Monitor. To reinforce、uh, medium to long term、uh, fiscal frameworks is a recommendation that would serve、uh, Japan well to follow. Now, on the、uh, issue of the、uh, DSSI and the common framework,、uh, Paolo has uh, already uh, mentioned that the DSSI、uh, played an important role. Last year and this year, but it does expire at the end of the year. A significant number of countries are in debt distress or at high risk of debt distress. They need a framework that allows an、uh, orderly uh, approach uh, to the management of their debt challenges. And enable them uh, access uh, to finance for sustainable and inclusive、uh, development purposes. That is the aim of the common framework. That is why it is uh, uh, urgent uh, to make progress just now. Thank you, Vitor. I think we have、uh, one more question from Webex. Andrea Shalau, Reuters. Andrea? Thanks for taking my question. Good morning, all.、Um, I, Vitor, I just wanted to ask you about the、um, both the common framework, and I know you just spoke about that.、Um, but but、uh, yesterday, did Malpass,、uh, or it might have been Monday, suggested that the, there, there should be some extension of the suspension of debt、um, that would be perhaps connected with the common framework? Up to now, you know, there's not been. A lot of demand, partly because、um, you know I think people are waiting to see how it goes with 
the countries that have applied, that's been very complicated. What, what do you think needs to happen for the common framework to be effective? And then I just had a real quick question on the RST. You mentioned that this, you know, the work should proceed on this, but it's been very slow and halting. It won't be operational now, it looks like, until next year. Is that too late? And why is it taking so long? Thank you. So I would uh, claim that the uh, progress that has been possible uh, to make in uh, 2021 when it comes to uh, making uh, finance uh, available uh, to vulnerable countries has uh, actually been uh, quite impressive. As uh, I said in my introductory remarks and Paolo again uh, repeated, the uh, SDR allocation of $650 billion is the uh, largest in the history of the fund. That makes liquidity immediately available uh, to uh, low-income developing countries, and it makes a difference. We have uh, already documented that our rapid financing facilities uh, channeled uh, financial re resources in a way that made a difference in the countries that needed it most. At this point in time, we also documented that the uh, debt suspension service initiative did contribute to making uh, resources available to low-income developing countries. Now, more is needed, and uh, both uh, Paolo and I uh, very much emphasize that the voluntary uh, channeling of SDRs from countries that have a comfortable external position to countries that are in need will contribute to uh, international uh, convergence, it will contribute to sustainable development goals, and it can be used to help the transition uh, that is implied by the fight against uh, climate change, and that is something which is envisaged in the new Resilient and Sustainability Trust that we would like to be uh, endorsed uh, in strong terms before long. The RST and the uh, Common Framework need uh, further progress, and of course we would like to see them deliver in an operational way, but this thing naturally uh, take time, and the fact that they take time uh, means that it is urgent uh, to make as fast progress as possible right now. Thank you, Vitor. Now let's go back to online press center and take one question on actually inflation. So it's from Anthony Rowley, uh, South China Morning Post. His question is, to what extent is fiscal stimulus contributing to rising inflationary pressure in advanced and emerging economies? So I may uh, take that one if my colleagues are comfortable with that. So the, the way I see it, uh, we have uh, inflation uh, pressures around the world that have partially to do with the dynamics of uh, COVID. For a while, COVID, with the restrictions on social mobility that were associated with it, transferred demand from services to goods. And there were pressures on goods prices. When it comes to energy, uh, Paulo has already uh, mentioned that there are bottlenecks in some segments of the energy market and some price pressures on those markets. We have also documented supply demand imbalances in some other uh, sectors, including disturbances to some global supply change. Global supply chains. Now, what that means is that you have a number of prices that are being pushed up and there is a recovery of prices given the lows that happened in 2020. Now, a lot of these uh, pressures are transitory 
And that is clearly what we have under our baseline. This, uh, these disturbances are very large, and they're an order of magnitude uh, away from the uh, fiscal support that was extended. That is, the fiscal support was extended to fight COVID-19, to enable the health system, to protect vulnerable uh, firms and households, and it contributed to smooth uh, economic activity and employment. The uh, fiscal policy was very steady in advanced economies in 2020 and 2021, and so it cannot be blamed for high-frequency uh, behavior in prices. In the annual meetings, we very much recommend that countries that benefit from a strong monetary stability and where there is, where the best judgment is that this uh, inflation pressures will be transitory, will look beyond the uh, current uh, peak in prices and focus on medium uh, to long term price stability, including the stability of inflation expectations. On the other hand, there are dangers of uh, inflation pressures feeding on themselves, and in that case, uh, forceful, decisive action would be necessary. Country circumstances are very different, and uh, what to do to tackle inflation depends crucially on those country circumstances. Thank you, Vitor. And we've also got one question from Masahiro Okoshi Nikkei. The question is, the Fed will soon begin tapering its asset pur purchases and may raise interest rates in late 2022. How do you analyze the risk of monetary tightening added to the high level of debt? So I think that the best way uh, to answer that question is go back to the fiscal monitor. In the fiscal monitor, we compare, for example, what we have uh, say, in the vintage of uh, uh, projections one year ago and now. And if you look at the United States, uh, we do have a situation where under our baseline and over the medium term, we expect uh, higher interest rates, say, in 2024 than we did one year ago. But the revision in the public debt to GDP ratio in the U.S. was down. Why was it down? Because the relatively small impact of increases in interest rates from historically extremely low levels of interest rates was more than compensated for by the uh, upward revision in nominal uh, GDP growth that comes from both uh, stronger price dynamics, but more importantly, uh, stronger real growth. Thank you. Let's take one last question. That's from Henry Kerr, the economist. The question is, what is the most important advice that you would give countries that are rethinking their fiscal rules? Maybe if you allow me, I'll take that one. So if there's one thing, uh, I would say, please read our report. Uh, but um, maybe I will highlight one aspect of the report, which is, um, as countries design and communicate their fiscal frameworks uh, to the public and to investors, uh, there are three principles they should be taking into consideration. Uh, sustainability, simplicity, and stabilization. And by sustainability, I mean to pick fiscal objectives that, of course, don't let the debt uh, grow and grow forever as a share of the economy, but perhaps even more importantly, those fiscal objectives should be both economically and politically realistic, particularly given that debts have gone up so much as a result of the pandemic. Uh, for simplicity, uh, it has to be something that people can understand. So to take one example that many people are familiar with, Many European countries chose to have a 3% of GDP limit on their fiscal deficit. That's the kind of thing that is very easy to understand for people. 
Um, but then the most complicated one is stabilization. And stabilization means that when you're in a recession, you have to allow the fiscal deficit to be a little bit larger. Look at the case of the pandemic. Um, very appropriately, countries that had fiscal rules, for example, used escape clauses to allow the fiscal deficits to rise. Conversely, in good times, it's important for governments to save a little bit more. And uh, so stabilization is important, but it does conflict a little bit with the simplicity of the, uh, of the framework. And so for the gory detail, I'm afraid I'm having to uh, point our readers to the report. And I'll end on that note. Thank you very much, Paolo. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you for your excellent questions.